All right, all right, all right. How you guys doing? All right. First of all, let me compliment you on your energy during worship. That was awesome to hear you guys actually singing and worshiping. Um, it was so good. I love... So here, here's a little secret about me. For those of you, first of all, that don't know me, my name is Daryl. I'm the minister of high school here. I'm usually up in the hangar every Wednesday night. And so this is an opportunity that Tommy and I, every once in a while, would like to switch just so I can see your smiling faces so that you're not a complete, I'm not a complete stranger to you when you move up to high school. Um, whether, you know, when you're done with eighth grade, that's usually how it works. Some of you guys are super eighth graders and you do it like two or three times. But like the, the normal progression is you finish eighth grade, you move up into high school. Uh, so when you get there, you'll see me uh, a lot, uh, more so than probably you want to, but that's fine. I'm okay with that. But um, I moved here about two years ago from Anchorage, Alaska. I was a youth pastor up there for 15-ish years, like 14 years, I think it was, 14, 14 years or so. Um, and it was just a, an amazing time. And just so you guys know, like this right here, like me playing guitar and singing, first of all, it's the first time I've done it since I moved here, um, because it's been crazy busy, all that fun stuff. But it, is, it was a major part of my ministry up there. I was leading worship all the time. I was helping develop worship teams and all that kind of stuff. I, I wore many, many hats. So here we have teams like Miss Stephanie that oversees the group here and does an amazing job. Give these guys a round of applause. They do such a good job leading you guys in worship every week. So great. And then we got Patrick. If you guys know Patrick up in high school, he leads our band up there. He does a great job. Pastor Tim here, who oversees our worship arts department as a church, like they do such a good job that I don't even have to like touch my guitar like ever. Um, ben had something that he couldn't be here tonight. Normally Ben helps lead you guys in worship. Um, he had something that he, so he couldn't be here. So, and Mr. Carl wasn't available and all this kind of stuff. So Stephanie asked me, I was like, hey, could you? And I said, sure, why not? Uh, so, uh, so excited to be able to be here with you guys. I'm really sweaty right now. I forgot how sweaty I get playing guitar. Um, but we uh, are going to get into God's word together. We're going to study God's word together. How many of you guys have been here over the last couple of weeks at least once? All right. So if you've been here the last couple of weeks, you know that we've been in a series called Storyteller, right? Storyteller. And we've been looking at different parables from the gospels, right? And a parable is simply a story that Jesus told to teach a lesson, right? That's the easiest way to kind of describe a parable. We can get into more like theological, like the whys and the whats and stuff, but we don't have to cover that. For today's purposes, it's simply a story that Jesus used to make a point. All right, and tonight we're going to look at a story that's found in Matthew chapter 18. If you guys have your Bibles, I'm a big proponent of having your Bible. If you don't have, like, if you don't have a Bible, if you only have a Bible app, that's totally fine for here. But if you don't have a Bible at home, please tell me or Tommy because we would love to give you one and get you one. Because I am a big proponent of like a physical Bible. Like I read a lot on my phone and I read a lot on my iPad. I use my iPad for a lot of stuff. But like, there's something about reading God's Word from the physical book that just I don't know, it sticks better for me um, personally. That's just my, my, my style. But if you have an app, I would encourage you to pull it out so you can read it with us. If you have your physical Bible, that'd be great. But Matthew chapter 18, I'm going to read from the ESV version. So if you have the Bible app you can, and you want to read exactly what I'm reading, you could do that. Uh, but we're going to read a story that is about a, an unforgiving servant. Now this is, again, a parable. This is not a true story, but this is a, a story that Jesus used to teach a point. And and here's the thing, at this point of Matthew 18, Jesus just got done in a conversation with his disciples uh, where he was talking about forgiving your brother if he, if he sins against you, like how do you confront someone if they do you wrong, like how, biblically how do you go through that? Like if you've been around the Christian culture a lot, you'll hear people say like, Matthew 18, man, Matthew 18. Like what they're referring to is the passage right in front of what we're about to talk about. It's this idea of going to someone when they've gone to you wrong rather than going behind their back and talking about them. Go going to the man to man, woman to woman, and saying, hey, you've, you've harmed me, you've hurt me, let's talk about this. It's hard, but it's biblical. All right, so they just finished talking about that, and then Jesus steps in, um, and he's asked, with a question, he's asked a question by Peter. All right, Peter's one of the disciples, and he says this in verse number 21 of Matthew chapter 18. It says this, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? as many as seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. 
Now, some other accounts, other translations, they say it like 70 times 7 or this kind of stuff. And, but the main point you need to understand here is Jesus is, is making a point of to use a, um, what is it, hyperbole? Yeah, hyperbole. He's using hyperbole. Anybody know what hyperbole? Any English majors in here? All right, what's hyperbole? Using an exaggeration to make a point, right? So Jesus, like, Peter is like seven. Seven's attainable. Like you could keep track of seven, right? It's like, all right, I've forgiven this guy six times. One more time, I'm done, right? 77, there is nobody going to be walking around with like a tick mark and being like, oh, we're at number 64. You only got 13 more before I hurt you. You know, like that nobody's doing that. So Jesus is making a point here to say like, listen, you should never stop forgiving people. Like forgiveness is part of who you are. As, as a follower of me, you're the, you should be known by your forgiveness. But he knows that his disciples are a little dense at times, and they don't necessarily get it when he says those things. And so that's where a lot of the parables come in, is Jesus trying to like shake his disciples and be like, no, no, let, let, let's try this again. All right? Story time with Jesus. And he says this in, in verse number 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed 10,000 talents. Wow. And since he could not pay his master, what his, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And verse 27, the, the master responds back with, and out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. Now, you can read this passage like that. We'll, we'll read the rest of it here because the rest of it's really important too. But I need you to understand what's happening here. So you can read that real fast and be like, oh, he's, he's got how many talents was it? 10,000 talents. And like in today's world, we go by dollars, we go by Dogecoin, we go by Bitcoin, whatever it is, right? We know what those mean. But like a talent, you're like, oh, what, is that? what do you mean, like being able to juggle? Like, no, no, like a talent is something very important that you need to understand so you realize the mass amount of debt that this guy had. Let me break down what a talent is for you. Ready? A talent is very simply 600 drachmas. We'll get there. <laughs> All right, 600 drachmas. 600 drachmas is the equivalent of 20 years of labor. Okay, so a couple of weeks ago, I taught in high school um, on the, the casting of the seeds. Did Tommy, Tommy do that one yeah. in here? Like the sowing of the seeds and like it falls on different types of soil. All right, what about the one where the, the field worker, like he was, he was unhappy because like he worked all day and got one drachma to Tommy teach that one too? So like a drachma is basically one day's worth of wages. Okay. So one day is one drachma. So like for that time, that would have been like one day's worth of wages. All right. So 600 drachmas, or excuse me, 6,000 drachmas is a talent, which is 20 years of labor. This guy owed 10,000 talents. Jesus is using hyperbole again. I don't know if you caught that, right? This is a lot of money. That's what you need to understand. And to put it into terms that you'll understand outside of just days of wages. So your average worker in America makes about $15 an hour. Some more, some less. Let's just use 15 for today's argument's sake. It's a good, like, first job, like, wage. Like, if you're making 15 in your first job, you're doing all right, right? You're doing okay. So at 2,000 hours a year, which is a 40-hour job over, you know, uh, a full-time job over 52 weeks, it works out to be approximately $30,000 a year, all right? That is... Um, just the one year's wage, 20 years of wages is 600,000. So one talent is $600,000. Anybody have $600,000 sitting around in their pocket? If you do, come see me. Um, you've better tithe that, all right? <laughs> and I'll make sure it gets it cash only. We'll make sure it works, all right? No, uh, but <laughs> don't give it to Mr. Rick, all right? Um, but so one talent is 600,000, 10,000 talents. You guys ready? Move the decimal point. How many spots? That is going to be $6 billion. This dude owed a ton of money, all right? $6 billion is forgiven 
All right? This servant owes his master six billion. Again, Jesus is using hyperbole to make a point. Like the fact that he ever got to that point and never paid, never would have got there. But for today's purposes, six billion dollars is owed to this master by this servant who's been working for him, and this guy knows what he's making, like as a servant, so like there's no way he can pay him back. And the master forgives him his debt by simply a plea, have mercy on me. But the story continues. Verse 28. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, a fraction of what he owed, a small slice, if you would, of the pie. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, I will pay you. He refused and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summons him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Let's pray real quick. Father God, as we unpack this passage, as we talk about it, as we apply it to our lives, Lord, I pray that you would guide us and direct us. Lord, help us to understand clearly the call you have on our lives. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This story takes quite the turn pretty quickly. It goes from like this massive debt, $6 billion debt being forgiven to a fraction of that, a guy being choked and thrown into prison over by the same guy who just had his debt forgiven. You see in this parable, there's, there's, there's two spiritual truths that, that are talked about here. There's two spiritual truths that you need to understand. The first is this, ready? Salvation is immeasurably great. Salvation, when I say salvation, I mean the act of being forgiven of your sins, right? Jesus forgiving you of your sins is, is like that first debt. Your sin debt is that $6 billion debt that you'll never be able to pay back. There's no physical way that you can make that money and pay it back. And, like that, and it's even greater than that. And God is the master of the story. You see, the master is God. He, he knows that you have this debt, and he calls you to it. But when, he ple- he, when the servant who represents us cries out to him, he's faithful to forgive that debt. But here's the thing you need to understand for the first spiritual truth of this story is that when we, when we look at it through the lens of the debt being our sins, our sins, the sins that we have, are guilty of, and the master being God, and us being the servant, that salvation, that forgiveness of the debt, that sin debt in our lives, is so great, is so immeasurably big. Like, there's not even a way to describe how powerful and how big of a move that is in our lives. Like, I wish I could, like, give you, like, just a a visual that even did it justice, because there isn't. Because here's the thing, every single one of us has sin in our lives, all right? Every single, myself, I have sin in my life. I have since the day I was born. Nobody teaches a baby to say no. They just do it. You wonder why? Because of sin. You're born into sin nature. 
And over the years, you accumulate the sin, not just the things you physically do or say, but the things that you think, the things that you dwell on, the things that, you, that, that go against God's word, that, that fill your mind, fill your heart. All those things add up, and that debt becomes so great, and there's nothing, listen to me, guys, nothing that you can do that can, can overpower that debt. You cannot be good enough. You can't go to church enough. You can't memorize enough scripture. You can't go on enough missions trips. You can't serve in enough food kitchens. Like all those things are great, but none of them even make a dent in your sin debt. The only thing that can do that is God. The only thing that can do that is the salvation that God offers, the immeasurably great salvation. I don't know where you guys are in your life. I know a lot of you, but I don't know all of you. I don't know where you stand with God. I don't know if you've ever had that sin debt forgiven, but I want to tell you guys tonight, before we leave, you're going to have an opportunity at that. You're going to have an opportunity to be able to go before God, go before your master and say, God, I I can't repay that debt. I need you to forgive it. And when you do that, when you take that step, no matter how big that debt is, no matter how big that list is of things that you owe because of your sin in your life, God blots it free, washes it away. That's spiritual truth number one. Salvation is immeasurably great. Spiritual truth number two, ready? Listen to this. Because we've been forgiven, we must be forgiving. Because we've been forgiven, we must be forgiving. Anybody like to hold grudges? It's okay. You can be all right. You can be honest. My hand's up. This isn't like me giving an example of what to do. This is me confessing. All right? Like, I don't like when people do me wrong. I have a problem with that. If someone crosses me, I'm going to, like, think twice about letting my guard down around them again. And to the point where I almost get bitter over it. And that's something that I have to work on day in and day out in my life because I know that about myself. I know that I struggle with, with, with grudges and bitterness and forgiveness. I have some family members that have done my family wrong. Not necessarily my immediate family, but like my extended family. My mom, my dad, my brother, my sister. Like, and like I struggle with loving and forgiving some of those family members because of things that have happened. And that's something that I, I, I have to work on. And at, as, as I was preparing this message, um, I was convicted of that. And I was reminded of that. I was reminded that, listen, no matter what has happened to me, I'm not called to make it right. I'm called to forgive. And forgiveness doesn't require the person asking for forgiveness. Let me say that again. You forgiving someone isn't reliant on them asking for the forgiveness. Forgiveness is simply a conversation between you and God. It's a heart issue. We're called to forgive because we've been forgiven. Just like in this parable, the servant who had this immeasurable debt forgiven, like $6 billion forgiven from him, and then he goes after a guy for a couple thousand has him thrown into prison when his life was altered with the forgiveness that he was shown and then he failed to show it again. And the master gets word of this and he comes back to him and he says, how dare you, you wicked and evil servant. How could you not give what has been given to you? Go to prison until you can pay it back, which you never will. I don't know about you guys, I never want to have that conversation with God. I never want to have to stand before God and say, God, I I love you, like, thanks for forgiving me, but I really got a problem with this guy. I don't want to have that conversation. I don't want to have that heart-to-heart talk with God in that moment. (laughs) 
Because we've been forgiven, we must be forgiving. We need to change our hearts. We need to adopt this um, forgiveness character, the forgiving character of God. We need to adopt the character of God. The character trait of God of forgiveness needs to be indwelled in us. As Christians, we're supposed to be Christ-like. We're supposed to be like God. We're supposed to try and honor God with the way that we live, the way that we do things, the way that we interact with people. And guys, I'm here to tell you that if you aren't forgiving, you're missing one of the greatest qualities, if not the most important quality of God, is his forgiveness, because it's his forgiveness that allows us to have eternal life. We need to adopt that character in our lives. My youngest daughter, is na- her name's Kanika, um, and she's adopted. She's adopted from Thailand. And we picked her up when she was two years old. We got to go travel over. My wife and I got to go over and travel and pick her up. And, and like, I love the word adoption because to me, it's bigger than just, oh, we got another kid. Like a lot of people, they hear the word adoption, and they're like, oh, that just means they picked up another kid. No, it's bigger than that. Adoption means full acceptance into a family. Full, fully embracing that name. Kanika got to keep her first name, but she got the last name Nelson. She got to be a part of us. Like she gets to be a full member of our family, even though she shares no genetic code with us whatsoever. That's what it means to adopt this characteristic of God. It's not like, oh, I like the idea of forgiveness. I'll, I'll kind of keep it in my, my, my wheelhouse and use it occasionally. No, it infuses into your life. When you adopt the character of forgiveness in your life, the characteristic of forgiveness, it changes everything. It changes how you interact with people. It changes how you work with people. It changes how you talk to people. It changes how you just live your life. So here's my challenge to you tonight. Very simple. It's twofold. First is this. Has your sin debt been forgiven? Take a second. Ask yourself that question. Has your sin debt been forgiven? Have you come to the point where you say, God, I can't do this on my own. I can't repay you. I can't get to this point. I need your forgiveness. And you cry out to him and you say, God, I need you to forgive me of my sins. I need you to to wash everything away. Like, forgive that debt. Have you done that in your life? Most of you in this room, I know, have grown up in church, and so there's a good chance you've probably come to that point in your life at some point. But I also know I'm not going to be naive and say that just because you grew up in church, you've ever made that decision. But my follow-up challenge is for those of you in the room that have had that sin debt forgiven. You've come to that point where, whether in a church service or a camp or maybe just in a conversation with your parents in prayer, you cried out to God and said, God, I need your forgiveness. I need you to forgive me of my sins. If you've done that, my second question is this. Are you forgiving? Are you forgiving people the way that God forgave you? Are you forgiving people the way that God forgave your sin debt? If the answer is anything but an astounding yes, your answer is wrong. And my challenge to you tonight is that you'll not just recognize forgiveness in your life, but you'll adopt forgiveness in your life. You'll let it infuse every part of your body, every part of your life, Be infused with the forgiveness of God and the way that you treat people, the way that you interact with people. That means it might change the way that you have to interact with some of your friends at school or some of your enemies at school. Might change the way that you have to deal with your parents. Might change the way you have to deal with your brothers and sisters. Might change the way that you have to deal with everyone. But I'm here to tell you guys, listen, it's the most important thing you can do. Model Christ's forgiveness if you've been forgiven. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Here's what I want to do. 
If you're under the sound of my voice right now, I want to ask you a few questions. If you're in here and you've had your sin debt forgiven, I want you to do me a favor right now. I want you to pray. You've been saved. You've, you've been forgiven. Like you, you've had that conversation with God and you know that you've been forgiven. I want you to just pray right now for those in the room that maybe haven't. But if you're in the room right now and you've never come to that point where you've accepted the, the, the gift of salvation, you've never uh, accepted that forgiveness of God and you want it, like as you've been sitting here hearing me talk, you're going, man, that sounds great. I want that. I need that. Guys, listen, that's the Holy Spirit ticking at your heart and trying to like get your attention. If that's you in here, if, that, if that's you, if you've never been forgiven before, you've never asked God to forgive your debt, you've never had that immeasurably large debt forgiven I want you to have a conversation with God right now. You don't have to use the exact words I use. You don't even have to say it out loud. God will hear the cry of your heart if you speak it in your heart and in your mind. But say something along these lines. Silently to yourself, say, Dear God, I'm a sinner. I confess that to you right now. I ask that you would forgive me. I ask that you would come into my heart right now and forgive that sin debt through the blood of Jesus, through the sacrifice of your son on the cross, his death, burial, but most importantly, his resurrection. I want that forgiveness in my life. Please forgive me. And just follow it up with a simple amen. Everybody's eyes are still closed. Everybody's head's still bowed. If you said that prayer right now, and you meant it the best you know how, like you might not know all the answers, but you know that you want the forgiveness of Jesus, and, and like you cried out to him and you meant it, I want you to do me a favor. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to have you stand up. I'm not going to have you do anything like that to embarrass you. But I just ask that you would look up at me and make eye contact with me. Just keep your head up until you make eye contact with me. I see you. I see you. Amen. Anybody else? As I scan the room, just look up at me. I see you. I see you. Amen. All right. Those, those people that just looked at me, I need you to listen to me very carefully. That decision you just made, that prayer you just said, if you meant it with all of your heart, you might not know all the answers, but I, here's the thing I do know. You just prayed and asked the God of all the universe, the creator of everything we see, to forgive your sins. And I know by scripture that he's faithful and just to forgive those sins. You can walk out of this room knowing tonight that if you meant that with everything that you have, that God just forgave your sins. And he didn't just forgive the sins of the past. He forgot the, he forgave the sins of the future, the sins of your heart right now. All these things, like you've been blotted free forever. Pursue him. Live for him. Forgive others now. Your life has changed forever. Greatest decision you'll ever make in your life is to ask for forgiveness of your sins from Jesus Christ. Everyone else in the room, I need you to hear me. If you're a believer in Jesus, you need to understand the call in your life to forgive others. I want to give you just 10, 15 seconds of silence. Because here's the thing. I want to give you an opportunity to have that conversation with God. If you've been struggling with forgiveness, if you've been struggling with the idea of forgiving those that have wronged you, I want to give you that opportunity right now. Take 15 seconds in silence. You're not talking to your friends. You're not messing around. Talk with God right now.
Father God, it's our prayer, Lord, that you would help us to be forgiving because we're forgiven. Lord, for the students in here that ask for your forgiveness right now in this moment for the first time, Lord, I pray that you would just give them the boldness to tell someone tonight before they leave. Tell their friends, tell a leader, so that we can celebrate with them. God, I pray that this group of middle schoolers would be world changers for you. Lord, that they would be locked in, radically pursuing you in all that they do. I pray that they would impact their worlds, their families, Lord, and one another. I love you. It's in Jesus' most glorious, precious name we pray. Amen.